Hello and welcome. This VPAL signature event, part of the Harvard Speaks on Climate Change series, is brought to you by Harvard's Office of the Vice Provost for Advances in Learning, partnered with the Salata Institute for Climate and Sustainability and the Harvard Alumni Association. The Salata Institute for Climate and Sustainability and the Vice Provost's Office for Advances in Learning present Harvard Speaks on Climate Change, a new series featuring Harvard faculty working on different dimensions of the climate challenge. In this inaugural session, professors Daniel Jacob and Stephen Wolfsey will develop into their groundbreaking research on the satellite detection of methane emissions, shedding light on the implications of their data and developments for future greenhouse gas mitigation strategies. Professor and Vice Provost for Climate and Sustainability, Jim Stock, will host. Without further ado, Jim, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks very much, Cassie. Good afternoon and welcome to this inaugural edition of Harvard Speaks on Climate Change. I'm Jim Stock, Vice Provost for Climate and Sustainability at Harvard and Director of the Salata Institute for Climate and Sustainability. I'm an economist and my academic appointments are in the Economics Department and at the Harvard Kennedy School. A core objective of the Salata Institute is to drive impactful research by Harvard faculty and students on climate change, sustainability, and the energy transition. To that end, the Institute supports cross-school research on climate and sustainability topics with a focus on impact at scale. Harvard has many accomplished faculty members across its schools engaged in important research and thinking on the frontiers of tackling climate change problems. This series, Harvard Speaks on Climate Change, will provide the broad Harvard community an opportunity to learn about their work. We will take you on a virtual tour of the research and engagement being done here on climate and sustainability. Each hour will focus on a specific topic featuring one or two faculty members. Tonight, that topic is satellite detection of emissions of methane and how real-time satellite data is and will be used to reduce those emissions. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas and, following carbon dioxide, is the second most important contributor to global warming. Since most carbon dioxide comes from burning fossil fuels, using less fossil fuel means emitting less CO2. Things are trickier for methane, which you cannot see or smell, and which is released from a great many sources, including multiple human activities. So the first step towards reducing methane emissions is figuring out where those emissions are, which raises some rich and difficult scientific questions. This afternoon, we are fortunate to have two guests who are world experts in using satellites to detect methane emissions. Our first speaker, Danielle Jacob, is the Vasco McCoy Family Professor of Atmospheric Chemistry and Environmental Engineering in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and in the Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. He will be followed by Steve Wolfsey, the Abbott Lawrence Roch Professor of Atmospheric and Environmental Science in FAS and Seas. Among other things, both Danielle and Steve are participating in a multi-faculty cross-school climate research cluster on reducing methane emissions, which is sponsored by the Salata Institute. Danielle, then Steve, will speak for a total of about 35 minutes. We will then turn to open discussion, which I will kick off. I will select or combine audience questions and ask them to the speakers. With that, let me turn this over to Danielle. Thank you very much, Jim. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm Daniel Jacob, and I lead the Atmospheric Chemistry Modeling Group in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And we work on a range of topics uh, in air quality and climate change. And presently, a major topic of our activity is uh, to use satellite observations of methane to assist dealing with the climate crisis. So, as you know, temperatures have increased by 1.2 degrees over the past century, getting us close to the one and a half degrees of danger beyond which we expect that major climate disruptions may happen. About half of this warming is due to CO2. 30% is due to methane. 20% is due to other greenhouse gases like N2O, for example. 
And then we have an offset to this warming that's produced by aerosol particles that are liquid and solid particles present in the air. A lot of them come from human activity and they actually represent a major air pollution problem. We're trying to reduce the concentrations of those aerosol particles, which will make then uh, uh, correcting global warming even more challenging. Now, methane, as you see here, is CO2's little brother when it comes to greenhouse warming. Uh, but as two siblings will always remind you that they're very different from each other, methane and CO2 do same the same thing. So in particular, methane molecule per molecule is far more efficient uh, than CO2 in driving global warming. Its concentration in the atmosphere is 200 times lower, but it packs a wallop much more than CO2. The biggest difference though, is, it, is in the lifetime. Methane has a lifetime that's relatively short in the atmosphere, about nine years, uh, because it gets oxidized in the atmosphere to CO2. CO2 has a very long lifetime in excess of 100 years. So because of this short lifetime, methane can provide us with a lever to uh, mitigate warming on the short term, giving us some more breathing room to deal with CO2 emissions. So if we were to zero out methane emissions, this is what would happen. We would basically remove one of the big contributors to greenhouse warming. We would decrease warming by 40%. Now then the warming would keep start going back up. So we would need to definitely take action on CO2 but it would take us, it would give us some breathing room to figure out how to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, something for which we need to develop new technologies. Now, as Jim pointed out, methane has complicated sources in the atmosphere. Its concentration has tripled since pre-industrial time. We know that from ice core observations. And uh, the rise in methane has become steeper in the recent decades. The dominant meth uh, natural source is wetlands. In wetlands, organic matter is decomposed to methane under conditions devoid of oxygen. Um, and the same kind of process happens with some human activities like rice paddies, like what happens in landfills, what happens in wastewater treatment plants, and what also happens in the stomach of ruminants. This is called the biological source of methane. We have another source of methane that starts in the marine sediments, where organic matter is compressed under conditions of very high temperature and pressure, and the subsequent reactions give us our fossil fuels, and in particular, natural gas, which is mainly methane. But coal and oil also contain quite a bit of methane, and when we exploit those fossil fuels, we will emit methane to the atmosphere through various processes of leakage and venting. So this adds up to a fairly complicated ensemble of sources, but that doesn't, need that, that doesn't mean that um, it should be difficult to decrease methane, because in fact, simple measures can go a long way to bring down methane concentrations. And unlike for CO2, there is no stockage problem. Now, every time we think about, an, we have an idea for, uh, you know, taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, the big question is, where are you going to put it? We don't have that problem for methane. Methane just gets oxidized to CO2, and it's a trivial amount of CO2. So how can we reduce methane emissions? Well, from the oil and gas industry, we can fix leaks, fix venting practices. That takes us a long way. From oil and coal, we can flare excess gas or we can even use it and take it to market. We can recover methane from landfills. We can digest gas from manure ponds, change cattle field, change the way that we grow our rice. All of these are not difficult things to make happen. But the real problem is that methane comes from a zillion of individually small point sources with highly variable emissions. And so if you're going to do anything to tackle the methane problem, you got to know where and when it's getting emitted. This is one of my favorite pictures. It's an oil field in California. And you see all of these individual devices that could be emitting methane at a given point in time through leaks, through vents, uh, through, you know, an inefficient flare. And you got to figure out where this is happening if you're going to do anything about reducing methane emissions. So this is where satellite observations can come in. Because with satellites, 
you observe the whole world continuously. And so you can observe methane everywhere on Earth, including in countries that would rather have you not know how much methane they're emitting. We have quite an armada of satellite instruments presently in space uh, to measure methane, and soon we will have a methane sat instrument led by Steve Wofsey, and he will tell, be telling you a bit about this. All of those instruments measure methane by a technique called solar backscatter, where we look at reflected sunlight coming back from the Earth's surface, and in the shortwave infrared, we have methane absorption bands, and from that we can figure out how much methane there is in the atmosphere. We have two types of instruments, what we call the area flux mappers, which will provide global mapping of methane emissions with resolution of a few kilometers. Very high precision instruments can detect small structures in methane concentrations. And then we have instruments that I call point source imagers that measure individual plumes uh, coming from point sources emitting uh, large quantities of methane. And we'll talk about this uh, uh, in the coming slides. Okay, so first I'm going to tell you about an instrument called Tropomy, which is one of those instruments providing global daily mapping of methane. It's probably right now the best instrument to do this. And this is work from my PhD student, Nick Belasis, in which we improve a retrieval of methane from that satellite instrument. And we get these gorgeous data, which tell us where methane is coming from. So we see China, where you have a lot of emissions from coal, from livestock, from landfills. Southeast Asia, we have rice, uh, livestock, and landfills from India, from East Africa, wetlands in Central Africa, oil, gas, and rice in Nigeria. Northern South America has oil, gas, and livestock. And then in the United States, we've got an ensemble of sources. Okay, now what we get from satellites are methane concentrations. And what we need to do is to figure out emissions on the basis of the concentrations. And we do this by inversion of atmospheric transport models. So let me explain. Generally, the way that we do modeling of atmospheric chemistry and the way we do this in my group all the time is we start from emissions of gases into the atmosphere and we transport those gases with the wind and out of this, we can predict the concentrations in the atmosphere. Okay, so now we have here a different problem in which we know how much we have in the atmosphere and we need to figure out the emissions that correspond to that. And all we need to really do is to reverse the winds. And this is what's called an inversion, where we infer the emissions on the basis of the observations. There's quite a bit of math behind this, but you don't really need to understand. That's a basic, that's a basic idea. So with this and using the Tropomy observations, we can quantify emissions of methane from all individual countries. And this is very useful, you see, because the countries have to report their emissions on an annual basis to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And so what we do is we evaluate each of those inventories. And we've been doing this on a project that's been funded by the Harvard Climate Change uh, Solutions Fund. And what I'm showing you here is the top 10 countries for methane emissions that we find around the world. And this is work from my former postdoc, Jen Chu, my postdoc, Dishang Shen, my former PhD student, Hannah Nasser. And so what do we see? Well, the number one is China, and that's because of uh, coal emissions. We see that there's other countries that have emissions dominated by livestock. So for example, Brazil, others it's rice paddies like Myanmar, Indonesia, Southeast Asia in general, a lot of oil in Venezuela, a lot of oil in Russia. And you see the United States is pretty ecumenical as to its methane sources. We have a little bit of everything. A little bit of everything. So we've had a lot of interest in the United States because this is a country that we know and that we can try to do something about directly. And I have a project with Carrie Jenks from the Harvard Law School that's supported by the Harvard Methane Cluster through the Salata Institute, in which we're trying to understand methane emissions in the United States in a way that can be useful under uh, the Inflation Reduction Act to take some measures. So what I'm showing you here is some observations from Chopomi from my former postdoc, Yu Zhang Zhang. We were here particularly interested in the Permian Basin in Western Texas, the largest oil and gas field in the US. But more recently, we've been taking a whole nationwide view in collaboration with EPA 
to say, okay, EPA, we're going to test your inventories. So they worked with us to produce the inventory in a way that we could test them with the satellite observations. And what we found is that the EPA inventory is pretty darn good. And I think that it's probably the best in the world. I mean, we've done a lot of work in trying to quantify methane emissions. And yet, a big problem that we have is with landfill emissions. Landfill emissions are underestimated by about 30%. Um, in the EPA inventory. And what we find is that when we look at individual landfills, we find that the EPA models actually don't have a predictive capability. So we think that landfills provide us with a lot of leverage and we're organizing a workshop in, in January to try to deal with this and make specific recommendations to EPA. Now, another thing that we can do with satellites is to look at individual point sources, as I was mentioning. And so we've been doing this in North America with the NASA GOES weather satellites. And this is, I'm pretty excited about this. Nobody had done this before. These are the very first methane observations from geostationary orbit. Geostationary orbit is an orbit where you go around the earth in 24 hours. So that means that you're always staring at the same spot on the earth. You know, this is what you know you see on TV during the weather uh, uh, forecast. This is what gives you pictures of hurricanes. Those satellites are not at all intended to measure methane, but we've been able to tease out methane and be able to look at large point sources basically as they evolve. So what I'm showing you here is a pipeline in northern Mexico taking gas from the Permian to Mexico City. And we see in this blocking valve, which is a valve that's used for monitoring, for, for, uh, for repair uh, and uh, maintenance of a pipeline, we see this massive plume coming out and being carried by the wind. It lasted for three hours, a relatively short period. And that tells us that it was probably a deliberate venting. Uh, and this is work done by my uh, postdoc, Daniel Varon, with a master's student, Mark Wittin. Now we've been having fun with this because we've been looking at all over the place and we've seen a lot of those plumes. Here's another example from Indiana. So this is a pipeline in Indiana. And again, you see two blocking valves and we see these puffs coming out. Okay, now it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, we should be changing those ventilation practices. Um, and um, this is the kind of information that we hope that satellites uh, can provide. And so this, we're very excited to share this with the EPA. Okay, finally, as this is my last slide. When we work with satellite observations, it's pretty complicated. The data sets are really big. We're talking about terabytes of data. Uh, we have pretty intricate mathematical methods with very large codes, um, supercomputing resources. And the problem with this is that when you want to engage with stakeholders, so stakeholders being government agencies or NGOs or advocacy groups or industry or citizens groups, uh, you want to actually give them the tools to reach their own conclusions. It's not great if, you know, Jacob from Harvard tells you that you're emitting lot, way too much methane. That doesn't sound very good. But if we give them the resources by which they can use a satellite observations to figure out their sources of methane, it's much better. And so in that spirit, what we have been doing in my group is developing a tool on the Amazon uh, Web Services cloud called the Integrated Methane Inversion. And what it does is it uses our best practices developed for research with my group. As we develop our best practices, we put this into the software tool. And the software tool is open access. It takes advantage of satellite data that are resident on the cloud. So basically it solves the usage problem for stakeholders. You don't need technical expertise. You don't need large computing resources. All you need to do is request emissions for a selected domain and period, and the IMI will do the rest. And so it, we're very excited with this because it actually provides with some, it provides a monitoring tool. Uh, you can say, well, you know, I want to, I have, a, you know, I'm responsible for oil and gas operations within a particular basin. I want to monitor emissions on a weekly basis, and we're going to give you this. And so you see, you can see the emission surges, and you can say, well, I'm going to do something about it. Um, so we think this is going to be a very powerful resource. Uh, you can read more about this resource at that website. Um, and with this, uh, I'm done, and I'm going to pass it on to Steve. I'm going to tell you about a project that we've been doing here at Harvard for the last uh, number of years. 
in which we're designing a, a new sensor to make me measurements of methane in the atmosphere, along the lines that Danielle was just talking about. In a moment, I'll explain uh, why we need these uh, new measurements and a little bit about them. Uh, the science team is led here by my group at Harvard and by a uh, companion group at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And uh, you'll see uh, also by at the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, so we want to reduce methane emissions. And as Daniel was saying, we, we really need to know where they're coming from and why they're happening. And we need to know that because uh, it matters when you try to come up with a, a strategy for reducing methane emissions. It matters how much uh, is coming out from which type of emission. So do you have those big point sources, as Danielle was talking about, very intermittent, these blocking valves? But maybe, despite the prominence of those, when you look at, uh, at, at a map, you might actually have more coming from small infrastructure-associated emissions, uh, abandoned wells, and that sort of thing. Are these emissions happening because of accidents and upsets? Or are the deliberate uh, uh, emissions, as Danielle was mentioning, might be true for these blocking valves? Or are they routine operations or chronic leaks in, in infrastructure? So in order to answer those questions, we're going to need data of a different sort. We need high-resolution measurements that can actually tell us not only about the big sources, and not only about the very large aggregate of the emissions, but also um, where within these uh, oil and gas production areas the methane is being emitted, which uh, um, of the uh, landfills are emitting, and where and why over a large segment of the of the uh, industry, and um, and be able to quantify how much is being emitted. We also need to make the data uh, accessible to real people and actionable so that people can act on it. And Danielle gave an excellent example of that with the tropomi data, where he was uh, turning these beautiful maps that mean very little to the average person into emissions data that you can actually use in understanding the emissions. So the, the project, the, the two sensors that I'm gonna talk about, methane sat and methane air, they're imaging spectrometers that uh, were designed here at Harvard and being built by Ball Aerospace. Um, and the intentional design of doing this is to be able to create data of the sort that I just mentioned so that we can reduce methane emissions from the oil and gas sector by uh, target amounts, 40% by 2025, asterisk, the satellite is late, there was a COVID epidemic, uh, and 70% by 2030. But th those are the basic goals that we have. To achieve this goal, we have to have a, a sensor that can measure at the same time area emissions, so be very sensitive to small changes that occur over very large areas and represent the diffuse emissions and point sources. We do something that does that at the same time, can quantify them together. And uh, to do that, we need to have fine spectral resolution, a wide swath so that we can see whole areas at once, and very high sensitivity and precision. So the first one that finds spatial gives you the point sources, the wide swath gives you the area source and the high sensitivity lets you do them both at the same time. Uh, it's hard to get three of those at the same time, uh, but uh, we seem to be there with our advanced design uh, uh, of this uh, sensor. The, the, the whole experiment, or the, the whole program will freely distribute all the data and we'll be making these data into actionable data products. Um, there's an advocacy component that is um, uh, resident in, in uh, Environmental Defense Fund that actually will take these data and bring them out to industry, government, and the world. And as Danielle pointed out, um, that advocacy has to be international in scope. It's not for us uh, here at Harvard or even anybody here in the United States to go to um, uh, you know, Uzbekistan or Tajikistan and say, hey, you're emitting a lot of methane. It has to be people in these countries. And EDF is actually working this. The funding is by private philanthropy from environmental defense and, new, and this country of New Zealand. It's not private, but it's, it's uh, not NASA. Um, and so the whole um, philosophy of this is what I would like to call photons to boardroom. We collect the photons, we do some very sophisticated analysis of this to produce uh, 
the images of the concentrations. We then do the inversions that Danielle talked about to tell you what the uh, uh, emissions were on, that gave rise to those concentrations that we observed. And then they go on up into the boardroom. This is a real thing. The satellite is fully assembled. It's shown there on the left. It's scheduled for launch in February of 2024. The schedule is pretty tight. We might miss it, but we'll be getting up as soon as we can thereafter if we do miss it. Um, on the lower right, you see the airborne version of this. It looks rather different. Uh, and we'll be talking a little bit about the results from this because it gives you a taste of what we can actually expect to see. So um, here, here is this, an image of the, of the two platforms that we use. We have two of these. Um, one of them is the Gulf Stream 5 from the National Center for Atmospheric Research on the left. And the one on the right is a modified LEAR 35A that um, was purchased by funds from uh, environmental defense and modified to have that little uh, uh, pocket that you see there on the side with a window made of special coated glass at the bottom and a little spectrometer there to make the measurements. So we've actually got lots of data from methane air that's gonna tell us about what we're actually gonna see when we use the satellite and also can be used in its own right as a tool for uh, starting this process of collecting data and understanding what's out there and um, who's doing what and why and what the amounts are. Um, methane sat will acquire 30 targets each day as compared to the 70 that we collected here over the past summer. So that gives you a sense about just how powerful the satellite technology is to, um, to be able to have an impact on this very important problem. And so let's have a look at what we see here. Over on the lower left, you see uh, an image of the uh, Permian Basin is on the New, New Mexico, uh, Texas border. Um, and you can see these kind of hot areas uh, superimposed on sort of cooler colors the hot areas represent high concentrations of methane and the cooler colors are lower concentration. In order to make this visible, I have aggregated the, the data, the individual pixels in our measurements at 20 meters on a side. This has been aggregated up to 200 to make it so that you can see it. So um, the, um, uh, the area of each pixel here is 100 times larger than the ones that we have uh, to use. And um, yeah, so why does it look like that, actually? You can tell that there's a lot of emissions happening there. You can see big streaks that represent emissions of methane. Uh, we went back three days later, and 80% you know, of these were gone and would have been replaced by others, and some of the big ones were still there. We're learning a lot, really, about, about how all of this works. Um, so th this, is, this is beautiful stuff. As a scientist, I just love this stuff. It is gorgeous. Um, it get, it's not going to be very useful to real people to try to understand methane emissions. So um, let's see, uh, home in a little bit, first of all, on the point sources. So Danielle showed this beautiful figure uh, indicating all the different sources with pictures of cows and whatnot. Well, here's, here's what it looks like when you look at them individually from space. So the one on the upper left is a gas processing plant in Barstow, Texas. We call this Old Faithful. It was producing about two and a half tons of methane per hour uh, every time we went over it, and it keeps going. Um, the one on the right is um, a, uh, a concentrated animal feeding operation, um, and the uh, cows are there uh, in that uh, in those uh, rectangular enclosures that you see, and the emissions are coming from a poorly managed manure operation over to the right there. There's a pond. Yeah, the, you don't see any methane over the pond because we can't collect light coming back from the pond. It absorbs the, these uh, infrared so you see the, the big pile of manure just to the south of the pond producing tons of stuff. On the lower left, you see a landfill, a Denver Arapahoe disposal area. And you can actually see with our, with our sensor, not only that this is producing about 800 kilograms of methane per hour, but you can see that it's coming from different places on the landfill. And there are reasons for that. This one probably has a failed methane collection system and you're seeing uh, emissions from uh, from broken pipes and whatnot, as well as at the active face of the landfill. And Salt Lake City there, you see uh, those little round tanks showing through in the way this image was produced. That's the Holly refinery. 
Um, there's actually two parts of it, and then there's people living there in between the two parts of it, and they're being exposed to the emissions of methane, which are harmless, plus everything else that uh, may be uh, in those pipes, that, that uh, it, particularly in the case of methane from refineries, usually mixed in with lots of other volatile uh, material. And then on the right, you have uh, the biggest plume we saw in the Permian. It was only observed on one of these things. It was emitting five tons of methane per hour. It came from the middle of an empty field. Two weeks later, the company who owns this pipe uh, found the leak and reported it to the state of New Mexico and said they had emitted about five tons of methane because they only saw it for one day, but we saw it there two weeks earlier. It gives you some idea about what to see. Danielle was talking also about the landfills, so I thought I would pick up on that. Um, we observed all of the major landfills in Colorado, um, uh, you know, like at least seven of the major ones. Uh, only three of them were really emitting large amounts of methane. One of them uh, that we had been seeing another Old Faithful, uh, North Weld County landfill, um, was producing a lot of methane in 21 and 22 and in 23 when we went back. It wasn't producing any methane because they had repaired the defective uh, system of, um, of um, uh, methane collection. So now this is kind of the holy grail here for, for this set of measurements. And I'm going to take just a minute to talk about this, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, on the left, you see that same image that I showed you. The color scale is a little different, but it's the same image of concentrations. And on the right, you see what we get out of uh, and analyzing these uh, using models very similar to the ones that Danielle talked about um, that uh, allow us to take those data and infer the emissions from the point sources, so those big plumes that you see, and also from the area sources. And it's really quite interesting. Um, most of the infrastructure is sort of in the middle of this image, and there are some big point sources there, but the area sources are actually um, more prevalent in the area where the uh, infrastructure is newer. And there's probably reasons for that. We can get into that later if people want to speculate about why that is. We can then compare these two and say, okay, the point source emissions are about 30 uh, tons per hour of methane. And the total uh, and the area emissions are about almost 60 tons per hour of methane. You combine to about 90 tons per hour of methane with um, you know, whatever it is there, uh, two thirds roughly being in the, um, in the area emissions, the ones that are too small to image individually. That was kind of a surprise. Um, people don't actually know that before. The, the Tropomi satellite can't see enough detail in here to tell you where these, which is which, and um, the point source emitters can only see the red dots. So it was kind of a surprise. Um, here it is, here's the one on the left there, the same one I just showed you. The one on the right is from the Uinta Basin. It's a much older um, oil and gas province. Uh, the Western part of the basin produces mostly oil and uh, the Eastern part, uh, mostly gas. And you can see there's emissions from both the oil and the gas regions, but more from the oil. And uh, that's not actually that big a surprise. Uh, the, this is a relatively old infrastructure, like the California well, some of them that, that Daniel showed, not quite that old. Um, but so there's a lot going on there. And in this case, uh, the emissions are lower only by a factor of uh, four or five, five, I guess, um, compared to the Permian Basin. But the overall production is a lot lower. So this place is not very efficient. Um, and it's dominated by the area emissions. You don't see um, the, uh, the point source emissions being very important here. And that's really quite interesting. And it's starting to give us some insight into the way this whole industry is actually working and why these emissions are happening. So to summarize, um, we designed and uh, built, we didn't build it here, of course, we designed and built a new, new, these new imaging spectrometers, airborne and uh, soon to be satellite borne. They measure methane with very high precision and sp spatial resolution over quite wide areas. So it's something new that we think will be a powerful tool in trying to uh, incentivize reduction of emissions. Um, the sensors are, are on both spacecraft and aircraft, and we're eager to continue to fly the aircraft even as the spacecraft goes up. 
And the goal is to uh, reduce methane emissions. And I think we've already shown that um, these sensors can actually provide new and powerful in information to complement um, some of the sensors that Danielle talked about. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, everybody. That's fantastic. Boy, there's <laughs> there are a lot of questions <laughs> to ask about this. And it is it's just super cool to see this, uh, to see all of this work. I'm going to start off with one high-level question about whether these satellite data go back in time sufficiently <clears throat> for us to understand. You, you mentioned that methane emissions have been going up, and especially even going up over the last three decades. Do we have any sense as to where that's coming from? Is that coming from increased oil and gas production? Is it coming from uh, natural sources? Uh, is it coming from changes in livestock uh, usages? Do we have the evidence on that? When we look at the tripling of methane emissions since pre-industrial times, it's very likely that all of the sources that Steve and I have been talking about have contributed to this. Now, methane has been increasing by fits and starts, unlike CO2. CO2 rises majestically uh, because of the increase in fossil fuel combustion. Methane is doing strange things. So we've had satellite observations um, since 2010. And so from satellites, we've been able to understand the increase of methane, where it could be coming from. So that period, uh, there's a strong evidence that it's coming from the tropics and in particular from tropical livestock. Uh, large increases in tropical livestock in Africa, in India, in uh, other parts of uh, South Asia. Over the past four years, the methane growth has in accelerated and we've had what we call the methane surge. We think this is due to wetlands. Wetlands may be providing a feedback on climate change. We've had a lot of inundation in the tropics in Africa, in Southeast Asia. Um, and it seems to be tied to the La Nina phenomenon. Some people say, well, it's a effect of long-term global warming, but it would be very interesting if the wetlands were responding as a positive feedback to climate change. Great. We have uh, a, a number of really interesting questions uh, from the audience. I'm going to focus on some of the narrower clarifying questions first and then broaden out a little bit. Um, one of the questions is uh, about the observation mechanism itself and whether the, the what the global distribution of methane observations are and whether some regions are under underrepresented to, underrepresented in our uh, in our observations or I guess not our observations your observations or in the collective ones. You have to have uh, th there's there's actually quite a lot of issues in in the sampling um, problem. Uh, the one that's most obvious is that when it's cloudy, you can't do these measurements. And so in the tropics, uh, the Nigeria region, for example, you can't do these measurements. Another is that um, mostly these measurements are made over land because water will absorb uh, the infrared radiation that we use to make the observations. Um, you can get around that by looking at, at the so-called glint point. You know, if you look over toward the sun on the ocean, you see kind of a bright spot where, where it's reflecting like a, like a mirror. Uh, and um, those are much harder. So uh, over water measurements are also very limited. And probably the biggest one is the time factor. So the satellite goes over and it's got to be daytime. You need the sun to do these measurements. And um, uh, we know that the, that the emissions are very intermittent. You can see from Danielle's uh, beautiful image three there of the, uh, of the blocking valves. You know, how would you ever observe that with a satellite that goes over and makes a snap measurement at one time of day? How often would you go over there and catch one of those? So, so that's an extreme example, but that's uh, clearly, clearly uh, an issue. So all of those make the measurements um, very hard to be representative and uh, poses a, a challenge. We know about this, and we are certainly trying to um, improve the, the measurement frequency and uh, coverage and whatnot to try to solve these problems. That's great. But I, I do know that you're able to um, obtain measurements from uh, using satellite data, using the remote imaging from countries that you wouldn't really otherwise have access to. Yeah. And that actually serves a role in terms of global emissions, uh, at least identification and and hopefully uh, and hopefully then getting those actors to reduce emissions. 
That's right. One of the ways that people talk about to having that be effective is um, by uh, creating what you might call a methane intensity index for natural gas, so that those uh, buyers who c- care about those things might um, be, have an incentive to buy the gas that has a lower index. And um, that is definitely part of what we're trying to do here. And there actually are markets that use that use that because some buyers actually do care about having a lower methane uh, version of natural gas. Here's another uh, really interesting question more on the science is why do estimates of methane emissions from oil and gas operations vary so much? In Graphia, for example, puts the average leak rate as high as 8%, while the EPA figure is closer to 2%. Does satellite data help achieve greater precision? Typically, the estimates of those methane intensities, as Steve expressed it, uh, come from engineering models, assuming a well-functioning infrastructure and predictable operation practices. Whereas, in fact, a lot of the emissions are associated with poorly functioning infrastructure and not optimal operating practices. And this is not recognized by the engineering models. It's interesting that we find in our work that when we look at all gas emissions around the world, uh, we find a factor of 100 changes in methane intensities depending on the country. Some countries have very low methane intensities, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, very low. That's because they have concentrated infrastructure, they have new equipment, and they are big gas producing countries. They are delivering gas to market. As Steve pointed out, places that are mostly oil producing will tend to vent the gas because they don't know what to do with it. Or as soon as the gas prices drop, they vent it rather than take it to market. Um, So there's a lot that we can do in order to decrease those methane intensities. And I think we understand why methane intensities vary so much between different estimates. Another question from the audience has to do with uh, uh, agriculture, and I might broaden it a little bit. I was rather alarmed by your comments about how some of the landfill emission releases are, um, uh, some of the landfill emission rele- uh, emissions are resulting from attempts to capture the methane and then having those valves not working or having the systems not working. And that's uh, somewhat alarming because a lot of those are installed uh, per- for the purpose of producing a renewable natural gas uh, and selling that in at a premium in, in the marketplace. Uh, there's a related question here about uh, ag and whether or not, uh, whether um, renew- regenerative agricultural methods can reduce methane emissions. Uh, and I guess the, the question, there's a broader question about how a lot of this works in, in how a lot of this works and incentivizes reforms in the policy space in the in in this much more complicated set of areas about agriculture and landfills. So there's a, a set of issues there that maybe I didn't articulate as well as I might have, but um, you might want to bite at those. Yeah, I think this is really very important, Jim. Uh, and there's um, this is a problem that is is got to come to the fore because, as Danielle's graph showed, the agricultural sector is very important. Um, when you're talking about concentrated feeding operations and concentrated dairy operations, there's a lot that you can do. <clears throat> so you can you can definitely um, handle the manure better than the CAFO that I showed is handling theirs. Um, and you can change the feed to the cows to try to um, limit how much methane they produce. When you go to more distributed method, you know, so cows grazing out on the, on the prairie and whatnot, it can be very difficult to f- even know what they're doing. I don't think even our sensor is going to do a great job of being able to quantify that. So I think um, we want to do a very careful assessment to make sure that we're not going after the, the most visible methane sources from ag, but not the more, most important ones, and see where, where that leads. There are definitely things that you can do. And depending on which um, agricultural <clears throat> um, uh, industrialist or sector leader you might talk to, some people are quite eager to consider doing those things and others really don't want to be bothered at all. So um, so there's a, there's a lot of work to be done on um, figuring out how to make sort of action effective in, in the agricultural area. It's a harder area than either the landfills or the 
um, oil and gas. So one thing I would add is that um, a concern with the agricultural source is that it's so tied to food security. And uh, it's a major source in the tropics, and we think tropics are driving the current methane rise. Uh, and who are we to tell the tropics that uh, they cannot grow rice and they cannot raise livestock? And we're going to have to reach out to them to change their practices. This is going to be very difficult. We need to have local people uh, working on this. Yeah. And thinking about ways that that can be done so that it actually improves improves quality of life, not not makes you know changes that are not going to be acceptable. That's right. Okay, so I'm going to jump in. Do your measurements help sort out the influence of trends in OH minus, which I believe is hydroxide uh, ion uh, concentrations and their determinants on methane concentrations, especially in the tropics? So I couldn't resist asking that question because somebody needs to explain it. Uh, what is being asked, and then and then go for it. I First love it. All, we, we have to acknowledge that William C. Clark is not just your average person around, around, but a former <laughs> professor, or maybe emeritus, or maybe right. still current professor at uh, at the at Harvard. Yeah. yeah, this is a question that's very dear to my heart. So it's 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 OH. It's a hydroxyl radical. The hydroxyl radical is a Pac-Man of the atmosphere. It oxidizes everything, including methane. It could vary a lot from year to year, and it could have long-term trends. And there has been argument that changes in the concentrations of that radical could be responsible for trends in methane. That radical responds to very complicated chemistry in the atmosphere, which we don't understand very well. A lot of my modeling efforts uh, go towards trying to, sim to, to explain uh, the, the OH concentrations. But with methane observations from satellite, we actually have a way to infer OH concentrations and its variability. And that's because the loss of methane from the oxidation by OH has a certain spatial and seasonal signature. So as Bill Clark was saying, it's mostly in the tropics. Uh, it also uh, is over the oceans as well as over land. So if we use satellites with a different wavelength observation band in the thermal infrared, we can get information over the oceans. I could get easily pretty technical, but I think that it's, it's a very interesting question, but I think that we can use satellite observations of methane to separate the effect of emissions to the concentration of that oxidant. And if we could get at the concentration of that, of that OH oxidant from observations of methane, that would be totally transformative for our understanding of atmospheric chemistry, because we would better understand the sink not only of methane, but of a host of other gases that are getting oxidized. I'd like to add, though, that um, if we reduce methane emissions to the atmosphere, we will reduce methane concentrations, and that uh, does not depend on the ups and downs of OH right. in the atmosphere. So uh, in, in the end, for, for at least for the project that I'm leading, um, we really care about reducing it. And if OH wants to go up and help us, that would be nice, but that's not not the, the main game. Yeah, good point. That's great. We yeah. have a couple of questions. Uh, there was one of the slides was a very interesting one where there was, um, I believe, methane concentrations across the globe. And one of the things that I had expected to see a little bit more of was higher emissions or higher concentrations in the Arctic from perhaps some thawing of the permafrost. And there was a question that also asked that same thing. So I wonder, and, and or maybe from Alaska's lakes, I wonder if you could address this concern, because I know that is a concern, but maybe it's not in, as immediate a concern or as quantitatively important as many of the other ones that you've listed. There's a lot of methane produced deep in the Arctic soils because they're they're anoxic. They're 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 uh, um, underwater because the water goes down there and gets caught on the top of the ice layer, and and so you get anaerobic stuff. But the the methane that is produced there really doesn't make it to the atmosphere for the most part. It's consumed in the soil above the above where it's being produced. So it does get out and the, the Arctic is a significant source of methane to the atmosphere. But we have really, really good monitoring measurements in the Arctic that go back to the 1960s. And there's no evidence that the, uh, the soil derived sources of methane 
to the atmosphere and uh, from the sediments in the shallow waters and whatnot. There's no evidence that those have increased over time, even though the climate has warmed quite a bit. And that's because such a large fraction of it is consumed before it gets out. There was a change in the total amount of methane emitted to the atmosphere from the Arctic that was quite large and that occurred in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And that's attributed to the collapse of the very inefficient um, Russian uh, oil and gas operations that, uh, that collapse occurred when the Soviet Union collapse. The, the new Russian stuff that's up there may be a lot better. We're about to find out. But, so, um, so, so, but the, the very short answer is that melting of the permafrost, while it's a legitimate concern, it's, it's, it tends. It, it doesn't seem like that's going to be the big driver, and it certainly hasn't been up till now. That's really helpful. Let me turn to a couple of uh, bigger picture uh, policy questions, uh, and we can use those to to close on. So, what do you think the most promising avenues for, let's say, short term and then medium term um, emissions reductions are? And, and my guess is that you might start with oil and gas because that's one of the big. Uh, focus, focuses, uh, especially Steve, of the uh, methane sat and those pictures. But but if you look just a, a little bit beyond that, maybe you could elaborate on what you think some of the big big opportunities are and where we would have the regulatory or policy levers or business levers to actually make a difference. And I'm saying this, it's a little unfair because I'm asking uh, the two of you a policy question. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so uh, you, you're the so measurement probably, guys, but still, you're yeah. involved. It's a multi-person, multi, multi-faceted effort here. Yeah, sorry yeah. for punting. I'll, <laughs> I want to hear what you have to say about so, that. So, I, I, I think, I think I'd like to. I can give a definitive answer as to how um, the data that we're producing will uh, uh, reduce methane emissions, and the answer is we don't really know. Um, but we do have uh, concepts that we'll need to see whether they work out. And I, I would start with the business community. So to the extent that people are going to um, prioritize purchasing natural gas from uh, places that have low natural gas intensity, that provides an incentive for the industry to start cleaning it up. Um, the, currently, you know, some companies are much better than others. Some areas are much better than others, as Danielle pointed out. So uh, in some of those desert kingdoms, the emissions appear to be very, very low. And that's um, that. You know, why can't it all be like that? So, so there, there uh, we, we think that that this will work through a combination of private enterprise, uh, people doing the right thing, um, environmentally uh, sensitive uh, investing, uh, and and regulation. It's not all going to be regulation because you can't really um, uh, regulate these kinds of details. Some of it is infrastructure, and I'm I'm struck by the fact that uh, you know some of this uh, stuff in the oil area seems to be due to um, you know just trying to get rid of the methane and not caring about it. And we could change that behavior. Um, we, we've seen a large number of unlit flares. And apparently the current rules require you to have lots of different technical requirements on a flare, but the current rules somehow, I don't know how, do not require the flare to be lit. Well, we could change that rule and make it uh, a violation to have a flare running that's not lit. So there, you know, some of it's easy and some of it's hard. Yeah, and it really differs across countries. Here in the United States, in the Inflation Reduction Act, there was a, there is a methane fee, uh, which is fairly substantial. That, of course, gets into the question of measuring those emissions so that the fee can be assessed. So it, you know, that's a policy tool, but it immediately just jumps back into the laps of the scientists uh, figuring out how to uh, how to do this. So yeah, actually, I, I'd like yeah, to make can I make a comment, a quick comment okay. about that, Jim? Very, very quick, because, and then we're going to wrap up. Very quick, because because it's very hard to use our types of measurements to make an enforcement action. Yeah, but but it turns out that the people who do enforcements know how to use our data. They use it to decide where they're going to look, and they do the enforcement. So so it's it's actually we, we can do more there than you might think. So that's a great note to end this on. It's an it's part of a, this is all part of a team effort. Uh, to really make a difference. And I'm just delighted to have had the opportunity to share this uh, hour with you.
I'd like to thank the Office of the Vice Provost for Advances in Learning and their team for their production support and the Harvard Alumni Association for their help with promotion and logistics. Thanks especially to both of you, Danielle and Steve, for giving us this fascinating discussion of the important work you're doing. It's a great example of how experts at Harvard are doing the hard work of tackling and solving climate challenges. Finally, let me thank you, the audience, for joining us. Our next episode will feature Carrie Nadeau, the chair of the Department of Environmental Health at the Chan Harvard School of Public Health. Carrie will discuss climate and health, and among other things, what to expect from the first ever appearance of health on the official schedule of the upcoming COP28 meetings in Dubai. That episode will air on November 16th, and we hope that you will join us then. Let me turn this back to Cassie to wrap up. Thank you, and thank you, Danielle, Jim, and Steven. We appreciate you joining us tonight for the signature event, and we hope to see you soon. For more signature events, please visit vpal.harvard.edu backslash vpal-events. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.